this is Jeremy Kling from The Absence, and this is Antihero Online. So you guys release your fourth studio album, A Gift for the Obsessed, on March 23rd. It's a kind of follow-up to the acclaimed Enemy Unbound that you released on Metal Blade in 2010. What kind of led to the kind of long hiatus between releases with this record? Uh, well, I mean, the long and the short of it is, uh, you know, some relationships just kind of went sour. Some people wanted to go in other directions. Some people did not. Some people wanted to write. Some people did not. Some people wanted to come over to rehearse. Some people did not. And it just kind of systematically just fell apart. And it, we did a tour. And after that tour, it was, it was really, really kind of, again, a sour taste in our mouths. And it was like, ah, we just kind of were at a stalemate. Finally, the levee broke. And... You know, stuff was allowed to breathe, and when when stuff was allowed to breathe, it did not take long for life to come back into the vessel, and everything just bam, 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 just really started moving and functioning. Uh, but in between there, it was just a long, a long break. I, I mean, aside from uh, our bass player Mike had joined Havoc, and then now he's with Soulfly. Uh, I do I do front of house for Sepultura and for Exodus. Uh, I've also tour managed Sepultura. I've I've been busy being a crew guy, uh, you know, a, a dad of I have too many kids to count. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, we kind of all we're it just wasn't on the forefront. And then when it when it was able to be on the forefront, it really just came back hard. And what was it kind of like having to regroup and kind of fill some of those empty spaces left by the previous members who ended up leaving the band? Um, you know, honestly, it was easier than one would think. It was, you know, this entire record was written in a month by uh, Taylor. He wrote 90% of it, right, um, in a month. When I went on tour with uh, Arch Enemy, I was doing drum teching and monitors for them uh, when they were on the Summer Slaughter t- tour a couple years ago, three years ago maybe. And uh, he wrote the entire thing and just... Bam, 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 bam. And we got together after uh, after that tour, and that was in between me. I have another band called Necromancing the Stone on Metal Blade, and uh, that was in between tracking that record, and we started really focusing on the absence at that time. So it really wasn't too – we didn't really skip a beat, you know, once we started – once it came back to fruition. That's what I was – that's kind of what I was getting at. Once life was back into the machine, the machine was going. And you got a lot of stuff going on. You got families, you're touring – with other bands, tour managing other bands, you have another band, and how do you kind of find that balance of the time to dedicate to music and working with two different bands as well? Well, I mean, there's, I think there's a, a few different kinds of people on this earth, and I'm one of those, uh, I don't let grass grow underneath my feet, and I always feel like I'm not doing anything if I'm not doing something. And I'm typically always doing something like I just flew home. I just played drums with Venom Inc. in uh, Europe. We did a tour with Suffocation. Uh, We did 24 shows in Europe. And uh, I just flew home today, as a matter of fact. Oh, God. Yeah. And then I'm right back at it. You are a very, very busy man. Yeah. Well, I mean, I try to be. I really do try to be. Um, I just like to create, man. I really like to create. I like to be. And... uh, I like to, I like to express and I feel fortunate enough to have any type of a platform, let alone several. And the absence is the main one out of all of them. It's the, you know, the icing on it. It's it. It's it. You know, I owe my entire career to this band. This band is, you know, it's, it's a baby. It's a child. It's, it's, it's a grown up child now at this point where, you know, we're many years in, and which speak, is cool. And speaking of children, how do you kind of balance the family life aspect as well? I mean, you're on the road a lot, so how do you kind of balance the time that you can spend with your family, and does the time? do you try to get as much time as you can and make those most important memories with your family when you can? Yeah, I, I mean, I do that. When I'm home, I'm home. I don't, I don't have, I fortunately don't have a, a typical day job, um, and when I'm home, I'm home, and I'm always there, and I'm around. And when I'm not, we have FaceTime and we talk and we see each other and I'm very much included. In I mean, when I first started touring was on the, the tail end of the, the dark ages where no one could get a hold of anybody when you were a touring musician. Um, you know, there were still pay phones out on my first couple tours and you had an iPod and 
you know, you didn't really have service. Now it's a complete different story. It's I'm, I'm readily accessible at all times. If there's any event that I, you know, I do need to be a parent or talk to a child or co-parent it's, I have the ability to, which, you know, it's not, I don't think it's as hard as it would have been 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. It, I mean, that's true. Technology does help out a lot and you can kind of, yeah, and, and my, my children are quite acclimated to it as well. I mean, I, I mean, unfortunately it is what it is, but I mean, trucking, the trucking industry in the United States is an integral part to our functionality as a country. And those truck drivers leave just like I leave, you know, it's, it's the same thing. It's a, it's a call to, it's called arms. It's a duty. It's a, it's a job. I mean, it is, you know, it's a, it's a career. It's really easier with the, uh, like I said, with the technology, it's much, much easier. And kind of going back to the album a little bit, <clears throat> the album was mixed by Dave Castillo at Sweden's Ghost Ward Studio. He mixed uh, Catatonia and Opeth's albums, and uh, it was mastered by Thomas Johansson. What was it like working with those guys of that caliber that have worked with so many big name bands? Kind of coming into the studio, did they draw any things that you guys had deep down that you didn't know that you could get out? Oh, uh, well, all the engineering and tracking was all done by myself and Taylor, our guitar player. Mm -hmm. Um, I own a studio. I have, I've had one for 10 years now in Florida. Uh, and I record bands also in between all of this madness and I mix and I master and also Taylor records and mixes and masters as well. Uh, we have several projects out in the winds, like, uh, yeah, we have lots, (laughs) (laughs) um, but we, we did all the engineering with ourselves, so we tracked everything. Um, it was pretty cool because David was in, um, obviously in Sweden, <clears throat> so we sent, a, we sent some session files over to him, and uh, we spent a day getting tones with the drums. Um, and we were just, I sent photos over and I sent entire sessions over, so we, he was able to dump them into his rig in Sweden, open them up, listen to it solo, hear what the room sounds like. He was able to shift mic positions and move them around, choose different mics to work with for the recording, um, choose different preamp settings for the recording. It was pretty cool. It was a really uh, interesting way to do it. It was like having him there, but it was also he wasn't there. Um, So as far as what was it like to work with him, Dave is a really great guy, and Thomas is a really great guy. How I've ended up meeting both of those cats through the the winds and the the rifts of time is – has been uh, humbling, but it's also it's an honor to have have these guys like on speed dial, you know, and be like, "Hey, can we work together?" And they're like, "Yeah, absolutely." And not, and more importantly, not just after the numbers, but they're excited to do it, like they want to do it. And uh, yeah, it was. I mean, because I mean, fuck, who isn't a bloodbath fan? <laughs> and I know I am. <laughs> so it was like, oh my god. The guy who mixed Fathomless Mastery is going to mix our record. You know, I mean, that it still tickled that inner boy, you know, the, that inner child, that inner musician in us to where we're like, I can't wait to hear this. I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> so it was rad. But I mean, to, to answer your question is we really pushed ourselves to explore and find new creative ways of doing stuff. Like uh, we have a really good system down, uh, myself, Taylor, and Jamie and Mike and uh, Joey. We have a really good system. And uh, this record was, you know, nothing shy of you know, explorative on that, on those fronts as well. With you guys kind of coming in and this being your fourth record with this band, what was the takeaway from the other three records? What did you learn from them what things did you want to kind of do differently any musical styles that you wanted to change at all and especially with the addition of the new members in the band as well well um you know enemy unbound had a bit more of like a commercial approach which i am for um but it just it almost had so much of a commercial approach it at times could be a bit flatlined um so we wanted to make sure that this record in particular had a pulse and had a vibe and had intent. So we really focused on playing with heart and playing with soul. And as long as we did that, we knew it would come across. So we wanted to make sure that this record had that. And as far as like genres or whatever, I mean, there were some sections where I'm like, 
I want to play some sick ass blast beat here because YOLO, or <laughs> I want to have a ride that is so unbelievably fast because I love Carnal Forge that uh, it blows my mind when I hear it. As a matter of fact, I listened to it on the airplane today and that song came on and it was like, the ride is so fast, man. I'm like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, it gives me the same feeling that Carnal Forge gives me when I, when I hear, uh, you know, Stefan playing drums, it, it, it always, it always gave me goosebumps here at him play. And then, you know, to be able to be in league with, uh, you know, his constituents and those and all those camps over there. And it's again, uh, I've already used the word humbling and uh, I've just it's, it's an incredible honor to just be even able to do this, let alone really able to fucking do it. It's it's pretty killer. And with you being the drummer, is there was there kind of like an inkling in the back of your mind that you had to one up yourself uh, when you went uh, back into the studio and started writing? No, I didn't necessarily try to intentionally one up myself. When I was a younger drummer, I did that. I like I had I had like impossible goals for myself. This one, I was just kind of like I really just did my best to serve the songs and whatever felt right. Whatever felt right is what I went with, and. Um, how I played drums the past um, like four or five years of my life has been a complete 100% spontaneity. I haven't written anything. Um, so anytime I go into the studio to track a session or I do anything, I don't do any preliminary writing or anything. I just play whatever feels right to the music that's at hand. The only one we worked on, which we kind of arranged a little bit together, was the forging. We we wrote together and that had a bit more of like a constructed feel. But I mean, overall, I still just went in and flew blind and just whatever I played, I played. So relearning this stuff for the, uh, for the a gift for the obsessed music video we shot and relearning it for the misery trophies video, man, that was a real treat. Cause I was like, Oh shit. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, cause I don't, I don't typically write like a, like when I write drums, I motif myself, but in an interesting way. Like, I mean, I'm like, like it's the real, it's a real sketchy thought pattern that uh, <laughs> I had to kind of like rechannel. But uh, yeah, it's so, it's just whatever, whatever served the song is really what I played. And I really was trying not to overplay too, but that doesn't ever seem to happen. I always feel like I always just overplay because <laughs> I like hitting cymbals. So. <laughs> And, and is that kind of the same with the rest of the band, too? They just kind of go in and play what feels right? No. Uh, no. Nope. Taylor is very meditated, premeditated. Uh, Joey is a little spontaneous. Um, Mike had some stuff really hashed out. Jamie is like 95%, 98% vocals, lyrics, everything is hashed out, done 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 to a t so no we we kind of all we all function differently well when, when it comes to that but at the end of the day you guys kind of balance each other's it's, it, each other out i mean oh you, yeah 100%. you could go in there and kind of do your own random thing and then they got their you know things kind of planned out so it kind of evens the playing field for everyone yep and you know i like to have as much material done before i actually go into play because i play off of vocals I'd like, I mean, vocal lines will influence my patterns that I choose just naturally because I just hear it and I'm like, oh, shit, got that, 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 and that's a, that's with a vocal line. And I'm like, I would have never played that if it was just a, you know, straight riff or what or whatnot or lead, something like that. I mean, I'll totally, I'll go off on a tangent and play, play a lead with a guitar player because, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it seems like I should. <laughs> Which I again I don't know if that's always the a good thing, but it feels right, so that's what I'm leading with. The album kind of features some, some crazy guitar work from uh, Joey Conception. I think that's how you say his name. Uh, technically, it's Conception, um, but Conception works as well. And Taylor as well. Was that one of the things that you guys kind of wanted to highlight a little bit? Was the their shredding abilities? No, because, I mean, in our previous records, we've always been a guitarded band and had way too many guitars. So, uh, you know, that's that's always the foot that the absence is led with. We've had, like, Iron Maiden, Arch Enemy vibes since day one. So yeah. we needed to make sure that we still follow through with that. Or else this would just be, 
in reality would just be a totally different band. Like if we were to take a like a complete at the gates approach and not really have leads then or not having high flying guitars left and right, um, it would it would just be a different band. Kind of staying the same, but evolving as well. Yeah, completely. You know, and that's and I've talked to a lot of uh, longtime Absence fans, and they were, you know, and a lot of a lot of the feedback that I've gotten from them was like, "Man, I don't know how you guys did this. You managed to retain the same vibe that the band had, but it's like you guys just evolved." And they're they're like really blown away. They're like, "Man, we're really happy with this progression." And that's all that any artist could ever ask for. Just into it, or just into it because you're into it, and then they're into it, and then we're into it more. The last thing that I got for you is with the new record, is there the possibility to be hitting the road again? I know you kind of want to take a break for a little while and have a little bit of family time, but with summer kicking off, you got festivals coming up, you got European festivals in the late spring, summer. What's the what's the plan for touring with the band? Uh, we have a tour already booked for July. I, it's not announced yet, but it is happening. 